to call this um, board meeting, business meeting to order. Please uh, rise at, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tagama Public Schools acknowledges that we are on the traditional, ancestral, and historic lands of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Puyallup Tribe. This acknowledgement serves as a first step in honoring our nearest tribal neighbors and partners who have inhabited this region since time immemorial, and to whom we give thanks for us for allowing us passage to their lands. We shall intentionally create inclusive and respectful partnerships that honor indigenous cultures, histories, identities, and socio-political realities. Uh, General Counsel of Enro, would you please uh, do the roll call? Yes. President Keating? Here. Vice President Schroeser? Here. Director Bombright? Here. Director McElroy? Here. We have a quorum, and our four student reps uh, for this school year are Zalicia De Leon, Amanda Peterson, Lillian Taylor, and Amelia Constantine. Thank you very much. Um, item number five, adoption of the agenda. I move to adopt. I second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Item number six, recognition of staff, students, and community. 6.1, state holidays and civic observances. And I'll pass it back over to general counsel. General. Yes, uh, we don't have any state holidays in the month of April, but we do have two civic observances. So 6.1a, the first is Dolores Huerta Day, which is on April 10th. Uh, on April 10th, Washington State recognizes the contributions of Dolores Huerta, the co-founder of the National Farm Workers Association. Dolores Huerta was a lifelong labor and civil rights leader who advocated for the rights of farm workers and worked to empower women in our state and across the country. And the second civic observance we have in April is Mother Joseph Day. So on April 16th, Washington State recognizes Mother Joseph Parasau, which is one of the founders of the Sisters of Providence Charity here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in the mid to late 1800s, Mother Joseph established a network of hospitals, schools, and orphanages across Washington State. Uh, and as a fun fact, uh, Mother Joseph Day became a legislatively recognized day due to the advocacy of a sixth grade class from Evergreen School District in Vancouver, uh, who successfully petitioned the state legislature to honor Mother, Mother Joseph with this recognition. And the students were able to achieve the rare unanimous vote of both the State House and the State Senate before the governor signed the bill into law. And those are our two civic observances. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, item number 6.2, recognition of the environmental health and safety manager's receipt of the Cindy Acosta Risk Management Award. Good evening, Board of Directors. <laughs> it's all right. We're real excited. <laughs> we definitely are excited. <laughs> the executive director of planning construction for the chief operation officer recommends that the board of directors recognize the diligent work of Jeffrey Rogers, our environmental health and safety manager, who is being honored for the Cindy Acosta Risk Management Award. At this time, I'd like to ask Ms. Brianna King and Michael Kanak to come up. Michael is our uh, sustainability manager who recommended Jeff for this award, and we all agreed. Uh, Brianna is the executive director of what? what Wasba. 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 Mm -hmm. Getting, sorry to take the limelight off you there. Sorry about that. I never there's, sure there's how enough it. limelight for everybody. We're good. Such I'm never sure how the board yeah. meetings work at each district. So uh, yes, welcome. I am Brianne King, executive director at Wasbo. So that's Washington Association of School Business Officials. In 2006, Cindy Acosta passed away. She was a risk manager in Sumner Bonnie Lake School District and her family set up a scholarship fund and an award through our organization to, to recognize a risk manager in the state who has gone above and beyond the duty of risk management for their school district. Um, we take nominations every year. We get a lot of nominations and Michael Kanak nominated Jeff Rogers. So I'd like you to, to say a few words on your nomination. Well, the first thing I thought of was when I, I saw this presented at another conference, first thing I thought of was, holy moly, Cindy's my cousin. She is my cousin. Wow. And I did not know that, that there was an award for her. And the second thing that came to mind was, why is Jeff not getting this award? Because 
While the candidate that got that reward was very deserving of it, uh, it's easy for me to find plenty of great things to say about Jeff. In fact, I wrote two pages of things that were great about Jeff. He touches every aspect of our, our buildings to make them uh, safe and healthy environments for students and staff to learn to work in. And, you know, I could go on and on, but we got limited time. So that's all I got. Mr. Rogers, please join us. <laughs> Talk. All right, thanks. Welcome to my neighborhood. <laughs> I'm very honored to be uh, nominated for this uh, award. It's quite an honor uh, to uh, have served the Tacoma Public Schools for the last eight years, and I'm looking forward to uh, whatever time will give me for the next few years uh, to do this job. And I uh, love doing it, and it's uh, a pleasure to have uh, met all the wonderful people in this community and be able to serve them with uh, due diligence. So thank you. So on May 9th in Tacoma, our annual conference is in Tacoma. We'll have 700 of our members here and we will be recognizing Jeff at our award breakfast with a video of the nomination and an award. So he'll be recognized there as well. So thank you. Excellent. Do we want to do it? Yeah. 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 Elizabeth. So Jeff, don't run away. Actually, we would like you, we would love for you all to come up and take a photo with us. <coughs> Please and thank you. <laughs> Um, item number 6.3, recognition of the district's newest national board certified teachers and recently renewed board cer certified teachers. And I see uh, Mr. Zeke Edmonds coming to the podium. Uh, thank you. This is always an exciting time for our folks that uh, put in a ton of work. Um, before I get to uh, kind of reading the request, I just want to kind of recognize what our national board uh, certified folks uh, do and are and who they are in our district. Uh, it's a nationally recognized advanced teaching credential. It complements but does not replace their actual state teacher license. Uh, these teachers voluntarily elect to pursue this kind of deeper understanding about the students, their practices, how they assess for learning, uh, their data, the uh, project kind of the trajectory of kids and that journey. Uh, the certification process is performance-based. It's evaluated using multiple measures, which requires that teachers demonstrate standards-based evidence uh, that positively affects the student learning outcomes. And it's created by teachers for teachers, and I think that's a unique opportunity here for a national board certification. Uh, and it's built on standards for five core propositions, which include teachers are committed to students and their learning. Teachers know the subjects they teach and how to teach those subjects. Teachers are responsible for managing and monitoring student learning. And teachers think systemically about their practice and learn from experience. And the fifth, that teachers are members of a learning community. And uh, every time I've watched somebody kind of go through this process, they, they get this group together, they think together, they uh, learn from each other. That's a huge piece. And in Tacoma Public Schools, uh, through our CNI department, uh, we've been able to support our national board teachers, providing kind of a cohort model, uh, giving them the opportunity for candidates to uh, do this journey together. And in Tacoma, the result then is we have about 240 uh, national board certified teachers, which is huge. Uh, I'm not saying we're competitive, but on the other hand, um, this puts us up there uh, pretty high when you look at other districts uh, across the state. 
Uh, we're honored this year for four new certified teachers uh, to the ranks uh, tonight and the privilege of recognizing these educators. So if you, hear, uh, if you are here this evening and you hear your name, please come forward. We'll kind of fill this space here before I'll uh, give you some time <laughs> to prep your hair before photo. Uh, Ann Privet, Catherine Lanzio, Hope Bixby, and Heather Timmerman are our four new National Award Rank teachers. Are you the only one? No pressure, no pressure. I'll be standing right here, right here, saying, yeah, we'll bring the rest. That's all right. Uh, in addition to uh, our folks that are new, uh, Catherine and the other three, uh, we also want to honor our 44 teachers who renewed this year. And so if our renewal candidates are also here, please come and join Catherine uh, as we honor and recognize your work. Aaron Anderson, Charmi Beauclair, Anthony Blake, Jennifer Brown, Rebecca Bird, Lynn Clapp, Rebecca Conger, Heather Conklin, Kate Deschell, John Devine, Jesse Dobson, Caroline Dunn, Tara Edmond, Lorraine Emerson, Iloa Evans, Alyssa Farias, Brianna Farley, Stacy Farmer, Sean Fullerton, Caitlin Gibson, Paula Grueling, Jennifer Grisham, Samantha Guilford, Summer Guy, Catherine Heckman, Heather Hutchinson, Kale Iverson, Heather Jones, Trevor Kagochi, Susie Clauda, Cheryl Connect, Jennifer Koenig, Chelsea Mall, Elizabeth Pavolka, Virginia Rayberg, Vicki Ree, Anastasia Salter, Stephanie Shepard, Connie Shines, Jessica Stella, Irene Stefan, Isis Tabaras, Jordan Viapondo, Silva Wilson. Can we get a round of applause for our folks? So with that, the Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning recommends that the Board of Directors recognize the district's newest National Board teachers and those who have recently renewed. All right, now we'll do the picture. Yes, come on down. There you go. File on in, file on in. No, no, we never. Let's get everybody over here. National Board folks, if you can cruise across the hall and join Michelle for some refreshments. Thank you. Can I just, can I say something? Yeah. So before you guys all walk, walk out for your refreshments, I just want to thank each and every one of you for going through the process. I know it's extremely arduous and takes a lot of time and you're already busy in your days working with our kids. So. Thank you so much for helping us improve and make sure we're a high quality district. What Director Bombright said. All right, um, item number seven, superintendent's report, 7.1 human resources update. Good evening. Uh, we, tonight we have a human resources update from uh, school director, or excuse me, uh, human resources director, Stephen Diedrich. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Garcia. Uh, good evening, uh, President Keating and members of the board. On um, behalf of Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Renee Trueblood, I'd like to share an update regarding our district displaced OP and PT staff that were displaced into new assignments due to position eliminations. At this time, the district has placed four of the OP PT staff that were displaced due to these position eliminations. 
Uh, Jacqueline Harmon will transfer into the office coordinator position at Crescent Heights Elementary School. Janine Jones will transfer into the middle school records and scheduling assistant position at First Creek uh, Middle School. Don Hay uh, Mays will transfer into the administrative secretary position in the communications office here at CAB. And Robin Mason has already transitioned into the school secretary position at Stanley Elementary School. We currently have seven additional displaced OPPT staff whose positions have been eliminated and for whom we are seeking to place into open positions that they may uh, be qualified for as alternate assignments as they come available. In the event that the appropriate open positions do not become available and alternate assignments uh, cannot be identified, each of these seven OPPT staff members are currently, uh, that are currently in a displacement status will be offered the opportunity to become substitute OPs within the district. Subject to any questions you might have on behalf of HR, we thank you for this opportunity to provide this update. We will, of course, continue to keep you abreast of any further developments. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? So one of the things that we shared with you and your guiding principles, uh, and these are difficult times, you know, we've been talking about them for months on men, um, is, is that um, as we have to continue to uh, make difficult decisions, we are still committed to trying to help each of our team members in their next steps. And so we do plan on coming back to you and saying, here's our next updates, and that to uh, ensure that we're doing our best to help through these difficult times and as transitions. And so um, they may seem small wins at the start, but you can see that we continue to make progress. Uh, these are on addition to the ones that uh, Assistant Superintendent Human Resources Renee Trueblood shared with you at the, not last meeting, the previous meeting. And so we are committed to continuing forward in that path. Thank, Thank you, Stephen. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, item number 7.2, Transportation Tiering Overview. Yeah, so tonight we're joined by uh, Kari Katman and Kristen Roland Smith, excuse me. And uh, uh, tonight we're giving you a preview of some of the work that has been happening. Um, you uh, know the struggles uh, because you've been actively involved in the way that we are uh, funded for transportation uh, in the state's model uh, over the years, how that's been problematic. Uh, and so we've been continuing looking at our practices. Uh, we've been learning from others and uh, examining what their practices are. And we want to share with you a little bit of the preview of our latest thinking. So, team? Great, thank you. Uh, again, I'm Kari Campen, Director of Strategic Financial Operations. And with me is Kristen Rowland, our uh, Student Transportation Supervisor. We're here on behalf of uh, Zach Middles, the Director of Transportation, who is not available to be here tonight. Um, and this is informational uh, for you. No decision needs to be made on it uh, for the information that we're sharing tonight. As a part of the um, cost savings uh, opportunities that we've been looking at, um, our transportation department is part of a, a cohort of 21 school districts. And as you can see on the slide uh, there, of these uh, 21, as far as an efficiency rating, um, our school district is the very last. Um, our cost per student uh, for providing that transportation is the highest of all these. And so we've been looking at ways to improve that. Um, as well as um, uh, making it more efficient for our, our, uh, our drivers as well. So the, uh, this cost per rider uh, information is from the 21-22 school year. It's typically about a year behind, and the newest information is coming out uh, in the next uh, <coughs> week or two, for which will still be a year behind uh, for that. Uh, as you can see there, if you look at the, um, the best, uh, most efficient cost per rider, uh, uh, we're more than double uh, the cost uh, of that. So one of the opportunities we've looked at is um, uh, tiering. If you look at the, uh, those that are starred, there's 15 of these others in our cohorts that use a, a, a tiered uh, bell schedule at the schools, which allows for transportation to do a tiered uh, schedule as well. Uh, there's only five on, on the uh, 21, including our district, that does not do a, a tiered system. And part of why that is uh, important is if you look at the uh, students that we have, our morning routes, of course, um, uh, we have fewer students in the morning um, riding tr our transportation, but in the afternoon, more of them. Uh, the bottleneck that you'll see here is with elementary students, the way our current <coughs> bell schedule is structured, every single elementary school is released at the same time, and so every bus available has to be there at that time to allow those students uh, to get a ride home. So 
So this is the uh, showing you what the current uh, bell schedule looks like. Uh, high school starting at 7.35 a.m. and ending at 2.05 p.m. Middle schools at 8.15 going to 2.45 and then elementary schools 9 a.m. to 3.30 uh, p.m. On the uh, change that we'll be having starting uh, next school year, uh, this will change for, you'll see middle schools actually starting first at 7.40 a.m with uh, high schools starting at 8.05 a.m. and then the elementary schools dividing up into two different groups. Uh, one of those groups starting at 8.40 and the other one at uh, 9 a.m. And so this tiering will allow us to kind of do a little bit of a, a leapfrog approach to making sure that we get all the students there without having to have all buses at one place at one time. Um, the, um, uh, this change will be a change that will impact uh, many positions in our district, uh, but as we've looked at the others in our cohort and how they're doing it, we feel it's uh, uh, certainly possible and will be a more efficient process uh, for transportation and for these students. The uh, list of schools that would be changing for the elementary ones, uh, that's not been finalized yet. We're still looking at, at impacts of what that might be for each different school, uh, but about half of our elementary schools would be on one and about half on the, on the other one there. Uh, so we don't have a, an official communication yet to share with what those or which schools would be at which time period, but we expect by the end of May that we'll have that uh, ready for uh, parents to learn for next year as well as for our district to plan for those, those changes. Uh, the cost savings that we're projecting here is uh, about a million dollars to help with our uh, cost reductions. And how that will look is right now we have uh, our general education students um, all ride through uh, first student provided bus drivers. Uh, we've, we've contracted that out. And then our special education routes are all um, taken care of by our, our district drivers uh, for that group. So with the, our district drivers, right now we have 49 routes and we don't anticipate that changing um, with the 49 routes that we have. Uh, we still feel that there will be efficiencies uh, because of the scheduling that will save us about $100,000 there. Uh, the big savings will come from our general education routes where we'll be able to uh, make those more efficient. There will be some routes that right now we tend to not have the high school students and the middle schools together, but there will be, as there, if there's space on the bus and it fits within that efficiency, then we would have, probably have some schools where there would be middle schools and high schoolers on at some point together uh, for that. Uh, also with these uh, adjusted times, um, it's also dependent upon the partner schools and CBT starting times aligning with our other uh, secondary schools uh, for that efficiency. And uh, what questions might you have for us? Are there any? No? I guess I just would say um, thank you for the thought that you've put into this. I know this is complex and um, it offers opportunities that we've been, some of us um, up here have been looking for, for some of the high schoolers to start a little later. And so there's some benefits that um, the students might see right away. So uh, appreciate you working hard to accommodate. And I know that this will be challenging for some families to get their heads around if they're in one of the schools where the time, I mean, right now they're all starting at nine. So the ones that are not, um, but I know that we're giving lots of time and hopefully working with uh, child care providers in the community and, and um, to make sure that, we, that people have options. So thank you for all your hard work and the team's hard work to pull this together. I think I do have a question. Um, so if you could go back to the 24-25 bell schedule slide. And I'm sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so it's just like the mm -hmm. mask, everything. Um, so it says the list of the school, it will be available by the end of May 2024. Is it going to come from your department? And then like, would it roll out to principals? Is it going to go on our website? Where would folks hear about this if they're like not here at the meeting? Uh, great question. And our communications team will be taking care of all that and make sure we go through the normal routes that we would. So um, we'll make sure we get out to families, out to internally, of course, to principals and teachers and others. So same routes that our, our communication team has been using. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. I was just wondering about that, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can you, um, uh, or also superintendent, talk about how, how are the determinations between the um, elementary schools being looked at in terms of how that tiering would happen? Uh, great question. 
I think we should let the expert in, uh, Kristen, uh, yeah. take a curse crack at it. Uh, geography played the biggest piece in this. Um, where they looked at schools that are close together so that we can get one elementary home quickly and get to another elementary quickly. Um, many of our schools are walking schools that don't have any busing, um, and we took that into consideration as well, but it was mostly um, regarding geography and how we can most efficiently get two buses to two schools quickly. Okay, thank you. So it won't be specific to um, just like this part of town will run on this space. And so it will determine based off of the ability to make double routes, if you will. So in, in many ways, we're reducing several things. We're reducing, obviously, we're improving the efficiency um, of the system, um, which has a direct correlation on our ability to save resources. We are improving the carbon footprint. We're putting less buses on the roads at a time um, in that space. And so that is good news as well. Um, and another subtlety, if you go to the first slide, uh, or the winter slide, if you will, um, in there. Um, and this is important, you know, we have a, approximately 27,000 students in TPS. And you can see that um, this idea that most of our schools and most of our population is a walking population or a drop-off population. And so we're very fortunate to have neighborhood schools in Tacoma where, you know, you don't have to travel far. And so um, it will have some impact based off of the ridership at that school, right, and versus just the overall number of that. So some schools have a much higher ridership, um, and so we'll have to consider that in that determination based on um, our ability to, if they're in tier one or tier two, and there's gotta be a balance of those. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will say that when we were, as we've been talking about this, I was surprised at the, um, what I thought was a lower number of uh, writers for a district our size. So I appreciate that, um, those comments, because I, I would have been, in my head, I had thought that it was a larger percentage of our students that rode the bus. But of course, if you're able to walk or be dropped off, that just makes a lot of sense. So I appreciate that explanation. So we will start after tonight's conversation reaching out to our partners uh, to ensure that they have time to uh, help us think through I don't know if there are fatal flaws in a situ situation. Um, so we will be reaching out to them. And we want families to, uh, to share with their providers as well, right? And so in that early space, we wanna give as much time as possible. And if there is a fatal flaw, then we have a little bit of time to adjust. There is a lot of work that has to be done to determine between that ridership in there. So all of our routes have to be realigned in that space between now and May. So the teams had a chance to start to do some of that work to see what is the feasibility, but not make those final determinations. And so we are eager to move forward with that. Um, so we're excited about this opportunity. Other small advantages, folks may be saying, well, what does this mean for sports? and all those opportunities and maybe the other grades. And so um, there are sports uh, opportunities. None of our league schools all uh, align in the same way, right? So what does that mean is this, uh, each school district operates independently. And so in certain sports, in certain situations, students may leave early from class. That happens now and that is very likely to happen in the future as well in that space. Um, but there are other schools and high schools in the area that start different times in different spaces. Um, questions around, well, what about middle schools? Well, in some ways, uh, starting earlier allows us to do competition earlier, and that is really important for middle school and a lot of sports in the outdoor sports because of daylight, both in the fall and the spring. Not a driving factor, but is another opportunity in there. And with that said, there's also, I would say, um, potential cons in several different factors uh, that we're aware that you know none of these solutions are perfect for every situation. And did I hear correctly, Car? I think you were the one to say. Are there 15 other districts? That I thought I heard you say 15 other districts that are have a tiered system similar. Uh, there's actually quite a few more than that. In our cohort that we've been assigned by the state, there's 21 districts, and of those 21, there's 15 that do a tiered bell system. And for those that are listening, um, and transportation is a highly complicated thing, <laughs> um, what can you t um, describe what it means, a cohort that we're assigned to, what does that mean? Uh, the state does assign us a cohort, and they compare us to, to the efficiencies that they're due, how much it costs per student. So we're compared to um, 15 to 20 other co districts, and as you saw, we, we are in, sadly in last place. And so it is time for us to um, step up and 
uh, make the efficiencies happen so that the dollars go back to the classroom instead of being in transportation. And so this is what's driving this. And, and the, the cohorts are about the same size that's what okay. uh, of schools, yeah, or districts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Same amount of students. They may, we are the biggest, but we don't transport, as you had mentioned, mm -hmm. we don't transport as many as you might think because we have so many walking schools. Our neighbor, we have so many schools that are in neighborhoods that can walk. But for the amount of students that we're transporting, as you can see, 4,400, many of our cohorts are being able to do this more efficiently due to their tiering systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other final questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Item number eight, staff report to the board, and there is none. Um, item number nine, members of the public wishing to address the board. Uh, General Counsel, do we have public yes. comments tonight? We okay. do. Um, public comment guidelines, school board members encourage public, public participation. Your civil input is appreciated. Board members will not respond to your comments during the meeting. The superintendent or a designee will follow up with you after the meeting if action is needed. Instead of speaking at, the, at a meeting, you may also send an email to the board at board at tacoma.k12.wa.us. Please contact the board office in advance of the meeting for disability accommodations. Under board policy 1430 public comment, the board president may terminate an individual's comment at the, when the allotted time has, been, has passed and may interrupt a speaker to require the same standard of civility that the board imposes on itself. Examples of uncivil comments include comments that are libelous or slanderous under a legal standard, are an unwarranted invasion of privacy, are obscene or indecent pursuant to the Federal Communications Act or any rule or regulation of the Federal Communications Commission, violate school district policy or procedure related to harassment, intimidation, bullying, or discrimination, incite an unlawful act on school premises or violate a lawful school regulation, or create a material and substantial disruption of the orderly operation of the board meeting. The board as a whole has the final decision in determining the appropriateness of all such rulings and can maintain order by removing those who are disruptive. However, the board recognizes the distinction between uncivil discourse, which it will not tolerate, and comments about the board, district, and or staff that are negative yet civil in nature. The board will exercise its authority to maintain order in a content neutral manner. Um, option number two, written comment. Um, and I am going to, there, that's the second option um, that folks have, so I'm going to pass it over to General Benro. Uh, yes, our first speaker this evening will be Joan Forche, followed by Marquita Dixon. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Joan Forche, and you've already heard how important Ms. Proudman is to Bernie from other people. I want you to hear it from my perspective as a deaf person and a teacher of the deaf. Ms. Proudman has invested a lot of time in learning American Sign Language. She has been natural at picking it up in a short time, where it usually takes more than a few years for others to develop the language. The fact that Ms. Proudman is able to communicate in our primary language, American Sign Language, it is important to Bernie because she is able to meet the children's needs for communication, especially deaf children who experience emotional and or physical issues caused by language deprivation because language is often not in the home American Sign Language. Ms. Proudman is able to communicate with these deaf kids in their own language without using an interpreter, and this minimizes their frustration. It is so essential because it helps our students to feel comfortable communicating directly with her instead of having to bring in an interpreter. Of course, the ASL interpreters are very important to Bernie community, but they often are busy interpreting in the mainstream classrooms. Those who don't know ASL often have to pull interpreters 
from the classroom, which impacts those kids in the mainstream classroom, Ms. Proudman eliminates that issue by being able to directly communicate with deaf students and with the staff. Now the question is this to you, how can we continue to meet the students' needs for direct communication with the new administration when we already have a successful system in place at Bernie? That's my question. Thank you for listening. Our next speaker is Marquita Dixon, followed by Brooke Hurtenstein. For the record, Marquita Dixon. I am here to speak, obviously you know about retaining Ms. Proudman. Um, one thing that I've reflected on a lot coming to these meetings and just in this situation generally is TPS talks about community, right? And your community is stepping up, telling you what we need, and it's still kind of we're hitting this crossroad, right? And I feel like you serve our community but our community can serve you as well, right? So I wish we weren't in this predicament as being in a deficit, but we can't change that. But your community is saying like, what do you need? How can we help you? And we get pushback and we get lies. And it's really frustrating as a community or for me personally, when I wanna be a go-getter and figure out how we can resolve the, rest the situation, right? How can you guys win? How can we win? Um, obviously you've heard a ton of how Ms. Proudman does, but I don't really think you guys understand. Um, so I wanna speak for some of the parents who cannot make it here or who are scared to speak because maybe they're scared of retaliation. So I'm just gonna read a few comments off of the petition um, regarding Ms. Proudman. Experience matters and her contributions to successful experiences for students, parents, and teachers are immeasurable. A promotion to principal would seem to be the next assignment for her. The decision undermines the very principle of community and student-centered education she worked so hard to provide. Her efforts have dramatically improved the school's atmosphere and student engagement. It's a mistake to overlook her contributions. The positive change she's implemented are undeniable. It's a mistake to overlook the progress she has bought, brought to us. She embodies what it means to be a leader in education the district should support her, not sideline her. This isn't just about one educator. It's about the message it sends to all who are committed to making a difference. Her focus on creating a supportive and inclusive environment has been trans transformative. We need to fight to keep her. The disappointment and concern in the community are palatable. The decision doesn't just affect her, it affects all of us. Her commitment to children's well-being and success has been a beckon of hope. This is a loss we can't afford. Reassigning her doesn't make sense given her achievements. We need answers and reevaluation of this decision. And so again, we're here for the third week. And it's just like, again, like where can we both win in this situation? because you're taking away someone who's done so much change and demoting her to a position, which in reality just doesn't make any sense. And your silence is loud. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brooke Hertenstein, followed by Arthur Perkins Klein. Hi, my name is Brooke and I'm speaking for another Bernie teacher who couldn't be here due to a family uh, issue. His name is Brian Riley. Dear school board members, I have worked with Brittany for three years. She's a deeply woven into the fabric of Bernie. She has a pulse of every family and knows every student's story as you've heard. She's a mover and a shaker. She's one of those Supreme Court justice, Olympic champion com combo kind of people who just marvel at and ask, how is she able to juggle chainsaws every day so well? Brittany is truly amazing, and if Brittany is loved and valued by the Bernie community, which she is, and she's loved by, and she loves being at Bernie, which she does, then why the heck would the district feel any need to remove her from this position? It really makes no sense, none whatsoever. Bernie's loss and poss possibly the district's loss will be another district's fortunate gain, short of the district's having the delayed epiphany that it's 
making a mistake here. But I'm not holding my breath for that, unfortunately. This, the way, this situation, in my opinion, has painted a picture for many Bernie staff that the district is significantly underappreciating and undervaluing the input of the Bernie community, and that's such a shame. I don't think a smaller school district would do this, but perhaps I'm a bit naive. I don't want to believe that this district that views our employees, especially strong, loyal, and effective administrators, as chess pieces. But the way this issue, sorry, the way this situation has played out thus far, maybe that is how the district views her. This whole situation has been an easily, uh, an easily avoidable, unnecessary mess. It defies logic. It defies an entire Bernie community who runs through a brick wall for Ms. Proudman tomorrow, and she'd run through the brick wall back for these families. Please give a genuine and thoughtful reconsideration of the reinstatement of Brittany Proudman as assistant principal at Bernie. Our Bernie community deserves best, and Brittany is absolutely the right person and is at the right place at the table here at Bernie. Thank you for your time. And now, since I do have time left, everything Brian has relayed in this message, I can back and support. This decision does need to be either transparent to the staff and the community of what really is the decision because ping-ponging back and forth and getting misinformation from one staff to another, to parents, to the news, to us being here, it doesn't add up and we just want answers. Transparency, right? Community, staff, families, friends, but none of you are being honest and it's really impacting the day-to-day -day in the building's aura. We're supposed to be able to show up, teach our students, and do the best that we possibly can, but we are not being supported from our community as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Arthur Perkins Klein, followed by Kate Pearson. Good evening, everyone. My name is Arthur Perkins Klein, social studies teacher at Hilltop Heritage Middle School. Uh, I am here once again to speak in defense of Haley Hathaway. As I mentioned last time, this has been the absolute worst year that I have had at Hilltop Heritage Middle School. We have had 15 lockdowns. We have had violent fights more times than my room has been cleaned by our janitors. It is insane. The fights happen when we lose one of our principals. When any one of them has to go to a district meeting or something else, that is when the fights happen. Very recently, we had a fight that was so extreme, several staff members got hurt, and a girl was kicked in the head repeatedly. This girl was still throwing punches, still very upset, but thank God Haley was there because she is the only person this girl would talk to. Haley was the only person that would calm her down. Now, that is not discounting the other two administrators at our school. Each of them brings something. They are a triad. Each of them have students that will only talk to them. Now, I understand that our school is losing students. We don't have the numbers. Last year, we lost two teachers. This year, we're losing four. Last year, we lost two assistant principals. One was forcefully relocated. The other one retired. And this year, we're losing another assistant principal. I understand with these numbers that we have to move people to the larger schools. They have more students. They should have more assistant principals. I get that. That is what we would call equality. Now, if you've ever been to a school board or a school meeting, you will know that the district's number one thing, and has been for quite some time, is equity. Is it equitable to take uh, assistant principals away from a very high need school where the a huge percentage of our population are at or below the poverty line, where we have violence almost every day, is it equitable to take away a part of their safety? That's up for y'all to decide. I can't tell you what to do. I can only beg that you let her keep her job and keep our school safe. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kate Pearson, followed by Jessica Castillo. Hi, good evening. Um, I am here to talk to you guys tonight about the transportation uh, proposal that was made. Um, I, 
I want to start by saying that fundamentally, I don't know that there's anything wrong with the bell schedule that was proposed. It's more the way that it has gone being proposed to you all by the district. Um, it was listed under transportation. It was not listed as a bell change schedule in the agenda. I, to my knowledge, the community has not been informed that this proposal has been made to you under the guises of bell changing, but rather transportation, which impacts far less students than the totality of all of the students and families that a bell change would have. So while I understand and am sympathetic to the budget deficits that, have, that are occurring in all districts across the state, and while I I get that there are um, a lot of intricacies of transportation and budgets that I don't understand. I do have a fundamental issue with staff and the community not being asked for their input in any way, shape, or form. And to me, this seems to have been um, presented to you in a very underhanded and kind of sneaky way. Um, and I am from a district that was starred on that, um, on that chart. And we were surveyed no less than three times on what we wanted to see in our bell change to address our transportation needs. The community was, the staff was, we were given options. It wasn't perfect for everyone, um, but we at least were given a voice in the matter. And where I sit listening to not only the comments from the Bernie staff and the Heritage staff, and my own opinion right now is that it seems that the district is coming at us as being they're the experts in what, our, what we need in our lives, and that's not true. We are, and we would like to have our voices heard by those that make the powerful decisions that impact us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Castillo, followed by Tiffany Luger. I, um, sorry, my name is Jessica Castillo. I'm a teacher at Bernie Elementary and I'm speaking on behalf of a parent. Um, dear members of the Tacoma Public School Board, my name is Martha Escamila and I have two daughters attending Bernie Elementary School. I cannot overstate the significance and impact of Brittany Proudman. To lose a leader like her would not only be a disservice to our school community, but it's also an irreplaceable loss. One of my daughters was diagnosed with anxiety at the beginning of the school year. Mrs. Proudman attended the IEP meeting to collaborate on the 504 school plan for my daughter's accommodations. Mrs. Proudman made sure my daughter's accommodations were met and did not hesitate to give me feedback. She made suggestions on how I can help my daughter at home. Mrs. Proudman illuminated a path for me to be able to help my daughter and support her with her academics. She makes me feel comfortable knowing that when my daughter is in school, she is there for her. Her devotion to the students shows how much she cares for them. We, the Latino community, would be devastated to lose Mrs. Proudman. To lose Brittany Proudman would be to forfeit not only a skilled administrator, but also a cherished ally and advocate. Her ability to speak Spanish bridges the gap between culture and communication, ensuring that Spanish-speaking parents are not merely spectators, but active participants in their ch children's educational journey. This makes Spanish-speaking parents feel comfortable and valued. It's not only the things I've stated that m here that makes Mrs. Proudman so great. It is her boundless compassion, her unwavering dedication, and her innate ability to forge connections with students that sets her apart. Please reconsider reinstating Mrs. Proudman. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Tiffany Lucher, followed by Savannah Fullen. Good evening, my name is Tiffany Lucher and I'm a teacher at Bernie. I'm here to honor and support Brittany Proudman. I would first like to thank everyone who has been brave and voiced their concerns to you all. I know that you've heard about the multitude of responsibilities that Brittany has taken on beyond her contract. I will do my best to focus on areas of the situation that have not been addressed as heavily. However, I do hope that you take notes as to how many people have repeatedly advocated for this woman 
and what he, she has done for our Bernie community. In March, we, including Brittany, were told, like you all well know, that her position was being eliminated due to budget cuts. Several weeks later, we were then told that we will have an AP position, but it won't be Brittany. It will be her mentee. What a compliment to Brittany's work ethic, dedication, and embodiment of the district's mission and vision. Then, at the last board meeting, I was told that there was a miscommunication, and we were never losing an assistant principal position, which has left me and other members of the Bernie community in the dark and speculating as to why this happened in the first place. I would like you to remember the phrase, intent versus impact. Since we were left to speculate the reason behind all of this, I feel that the true reason is something intentional and dismissive of her heart and her work at Bernie. To remove her not just from Bernie, but from an admin position is astonishing. As a reminder, she was honored as a whole child educator. What message does that send in relation to the mission and vision of this district? I will leave you with this. Think back to when you were a student. Who is somebody who made you not just feel, but know that you are somebody, that you do matter, your feelings are valued, and that you are loved? Somebody who rooted for you, even on your most challenging and darkest days. How would you feel if that person who was always your biggest cheerleader, was treated in the same way that Brittany has been. Would you fight for them? Would you speak up? Would you enact change? Remember those words behind you, every student, every day, and know that that's Brittany Proudman. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Savannah Fallen, followed by, I believe, Martha Escamilla. Hello. Hello, my name is Savannah Fallen, and I am an ESP 101 at Bernie. In times of uncertainty and upheaval, the true measure of an institution's strength lies in its ability to recognize and rectify injustices, such as the case with the elimination of Brittany Proudman. It has been upsetting to watch injustice at the hands of our district where integrity and fairness should be paramount. Brittany Proudman has consistently demonstrated tireless dedication and a genuine commitment to the well-being and success of our students. Her contributions to our school and community go above and beyond her role and her performance has consistently outshone that of her superior. She is present. She often runs the building by herself. She meets the concerns of staff. She is supportive. She makes you feel seen. She makes her students feel seen. She is by far the most devoted and hardworking administrator I've ever worked for. And I refuse to stand idly by while the career and reputation of a dedicated leader is callously destroyed at the hands of her evaluator. After countless testimony from staff, parents, and students, it's baffling how one could say this is happening due to her performance. Even more baffling how you value a mark on a piece of paper more than overwhelming testimony. First we were told budget cuts, but you funded that position. Then we were told it was a personnel decision and a result of evaluations. But how could that be true, seeing how many people have come to defend her work? This decision is wrong. I deeply urge you to be transparent and honest with staff and parents seeking the truth because the well-rehearsed answers that lead us nowhere have felt deeply insulting and careless. Brittany Proudman's impact will be best reflected in the many sad students who will be grieving the loss of their advocate, safe place, and champion. Someone inspires them to be their best when their realities of life may beat them down. This is a plea to the district to reconsider their decision and launch an investigation and restore Brittany Proudman to her rightful role as the Vice Principal of Bernie, or as she has earned the principal. Your loss will be someone else's gain. All right, our next speaker is listed as 
Martha Escamilla and Jessica Castillo, which I think we, we had already. Okay, fine. thank you. Thank Our you. next speaker then is Jimmy Blaze, followed by Ken Paulson. My name is Jimmy Blaze, and I'm here, and I'm a, a student from Bernie, and I'm here to support Ms. Proudman. Ms. Proudman is so helpful and kind, and she is, and she helps out with some kids, and she even helps out with me. But she does keep the school safe and keeps us safe too. But if we did, if we did not have her, it would be different at our school and. Most kids might go crazy and not listen that much. And I might get mad and crazy, but I've been keeping control of myself and not going crazy. And Ms. Proudman helped me out with that. So thank you, thank, thank you for helping me out in the school. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Ken Paulson, uh, and our last speaker will be Amy Kimmel. Hello, I'm Ken Paulson. 60 plus years ago, I went to grade school in Tacoma. They didn't teach phonics then, which was unfortunate. So educated people did an experiment on us they decided to not teach phonics. That was a mistake. Now, about 18 years ago, my youngest son, who went to UP schools, was going into middle school, and there was a controversy about new math and old math. And I had learned that new math was very confusing. I knew somebody who had a son who had taken new math. So I said to my son, you're going to take old math, because they allowed both tracks. So a few years later, he was in engineering school, the first semester. An engineering university took engineering. And he said, called me up, Dad, I'm so glad I took old math. Uh, all, A-L-L, -L, all. The kids who took new math, they're at the back of the class. They are learning from zero. Now, my son went on to be an engineer who supervises a group of engineers that fixes nuclear power plants. They don't do the radiation stuff, but they do other stuff. And how would you like new math peeps fixing a nuclear power plant. We wouldn't like that. I gotta look at my notes here. So, we have another new thing coming. And I'm gonna read this for five-year-olds next year. Understanding there are many ways to express gender. Another group of educated people deciding to do another experiment on kids. I think 10 years from now we'll find that to be a big mistake. There's lots of interesting things coming out and once these kids chop stuff off, it's gone. So, my daughter was actually a teacher at Bernie, Jennifer Paulson. She went to private school. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our last speaker this evening will be Amy Kimmel. Hello, hello. Sorry. Hi, I am Amy Kimmel. 
I am an ESP, educate, support, um, and I'm also a parent for the deaf. I have two deaf kids and two hearing kids. Um, two of them are here. I'm sorry, I'm here um, as a parent. I'm here to talk about um, the impacts as a parent and as it's impacting my children. So two things. Um, one of our buildings, we don't have any clean water in it. There's no dr drinking water. There's no heat. Um, the heat has to be off, and I'm not sure why. Um, I guess it's irritating to other people. My, my kids go to school in there for specialized um, classes, but there's other people that are in there all day, and it's just, it's just not okay. It's not acceptable. Um, we have an old building that's been sitting vacant, but it's being used for storage. It's supposed to be our soccer field. Both my kids love to play soccer, but we don't have a field for them to play on. It's, um, it's mud, and instead, every day they come home filthy and muddy. And then um, the other uh, that I wanted to talk about is um, our assistant principal, who's amazing, Brittany Proudman. She's done great things to serve our community, bring us together. Um, I don't need to expand a lot on it because it's already been mentioned, but one thing I want you to um, talk about is realize the impact that it's ha having on our community. We have eight deaf staff, not one, not two, but we have eight. Five of those are deaf teachers, teachers of the deaf, and three of those are, um, they, they have deaf children, they sign several parents that are deaf that have hearing children. So there's a huge struggle with communication because of that, but Brittany eliminates that. Tacoma has a great pride in one of the largest deaf and hard of hearing programs in Washington State, but you're taking away one of those people that makes a huge impact within our deaf community at Bernie Elementary, and Brittany is that person. Brittany Proudman is that person. And Brittany, for every deaf person, every deaf student, she's there for them every single day. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes uh, verbal public comment for this evening. Okay. Um, all right, moving on to item number 10, the consent agenda. Is Move there to adopt the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? It passes. <coughs> moving on to item number 11, policy matters. There are none. Item number 12, financial report. The district's monthly financial report will be presented at the April 28, 2004 business meeting. Monthly financial statements can be found on the district website at www.tacomaschools.org backslash departments backslash business and finance. Item number 13, curriculum and instruction. There are no items. Item number 14, business matters. Item 14.1, approval of interlocal agreement between Tacoma Housing Authority and Tacoma Public Schools for the 2023 through 2024 school year. The superintendent recommends that the board of directors approve the interlocal agreement between the Tacoma Housing Authority and Tacoma Public Schools, committing the district to provide 125,000 included sales tax for the 23-24 school year. I move item 14.1. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Item 14.2, approval of contract number TSD-23-085, amendment number three between Lilac City Behavioral Services and Tacoma Public Schools from August 1st, 2023 through July 31st, 2028. The Deputy Superintendent, on behalf of the Director of Student Services, recommends that the Board of Directors approve contract number TSD 23085, Amendment Number 3, between Lilac City Behavioral Services and Tacoma <coughs> Public Schools from August 1, 2023 to July 31, 2028, Funding Source Student Services. I move to adopt 14.2. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Item 14.3, approval of Solar Winds software renewal from May 14 or May 19th, 2024 through May 19th, 2025. 
Good evening, members of the board. My name is Ron Tiedemann, Director of Enterprise Applications. The Director of Enterprise Applications, on behalf of the Chief Information Officer, recommends that the Board of Directors approve SolarWinds software renewal from May 19, 2024 through May 19, 2025 for an estimated cost of $224,259.75. Uh, funding source will be technology levy fund. I move item 14.3. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, I have a question, actually. Um, in reading um, the attached document, um, can you explain what um, it means, a service desk software, desk software? What does that mean um, for those that um, are listening? Sure, this is the software application that we support. Essentially, we call it Help Desk, which is staff and students. We have about 35,000 people using it, and they. this is how the technology department tracks trouble tickets and problems in the field with computers and software. Excellent, thank you. Um, all right, so no more other, any other comments or questions? All right, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It passes. Thank you. Um, item 14.4, approval of interlocal agreement for funding, development, and future use of new fields at the Peck Community Sports Park. The Executive Director of Planning and Construction for Chief Operation Officer recommends that the Board of Directors approve the Superintendent to approve the interlocal agreement between Metro Parks Tacoma and Tacoma Public Schools for the construction of sports fields at the Peck Community Sports Park. Estimated cost for a TPS to construct the fields is $5 million, and MPT will reimburse a total of $458,487.78 to the Peck Ball Field Project. Funding source capital bond approved by the voters in February 11th of 2020. I move to adopt 14.4. I second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Uh, Morris is sticking <laughs> around. Um, item 14.5, approval to amend prior board approval to include initial consultant services agreement with Coresmo Construction for the design build services for the Lowell Elementary School replacement project. The Executive Director of Planning Construction for the Chief Operation Officer recommends that the Board of Directors approve the superintendent to negotiate and award a contract to Coresmo Construction for the design build alternative method method for Loyal Elementary School or Loyal Elementary Replacement Project. The new total approved amount will be $2,755,545 excluding sales tax, funding source, capital bond issues as approved by voters on February 11th of 2020. I move item 14.5. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Item 14.6, approval of bid acceptance with J.A. Morris Construction for the Lincoln High School CMAR Clinic project. Give me one second, I'm kind of out of order. <laughs> the Executive Director of Planning and Construction for the Chief Operation Officer recommends that the Board of Directors approve the Superintendent's acceptance of the bid for the Lincoln High School CMAR Clinic project for J.A. Morris Construction in the amount of $319,000 excluding sales tax, funding source, capital project, bond issues approved by voters on February 11th, 2020. Oh, second. It's been moved, yeah. Yeah. It's been moved and seconded. Um, are there any questions or comments? Um, I just have one, just for the public, could you explain um, what uh, CMAR Clinic is? Because CMAR Clinic doesn't necessarily explain. The CMAR um, Clinic is a clinic that would be placed inside of the building itself so, so that both the students that, that are on campus have ap access to health care for them and their, and their families. There is a time that will be set aside for some community use, but not necessarily during the school day. And can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So is CMAR um, exclusively is it physical health or mental health or both, or what does it provide? CMAR is a comprehensive medical uh, clinic, um, meaning that um, our partnership is CMAR is an independent agency. They are the medical providers. And what we do in that partnership is, is we allow them to use that space to provide the services that they believe that are needed at that time and that they can staff. 
And so they do have some flexibility in what services they offer um, in there. So we are trying to close some of the um, healthcare equity uh, gaps in our community by providing that clinic there for our students. It is, will run very similar to, to Mount Tahoma. Thank you. Yeah. That's also, I'm just, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any comments or additional questions? I'm just thrilled with this project. All right. Um, it's moved, moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Um, item 14.7 approval of Puget Sound Joint Purchasing Cooperative. Um, interlocal agreement. The executive director of plan construction for the chief operation officer recommends that the board of directors approve the superintendent to resume the approval of the interlocal agreement with Puget Sound Joint Purchasing Cooperative for an estimate of $1,000 per year for $5,000 over a five year agreement funding source nutritional services budget. I move to adopt item 14.7. Can I second? It's been moved and seconded. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Um, item 14.8, approval to negotiate and award a contract with ATS Automation for consultant services for the Energy Conservation Project. The Executive Director of Planning and Construction for the Chief Operation Officer recommends that the Board of Directors approve the Superintendent to negotiate and award a contract to ATS Automation for consultant services for the Energy Con Conservation Project Funding Source Capital Bond Project, Capital Bond Issues, as approved by voters on February 11th of 2020. I'm, I move item 14.8. Second. Third. It's been moved and seconded. Um, for um, the public, could you just um, talk a little bit more about what this means or what this is about? What, what the state is, and, I'm, and, and I'm, my, my apologies, I don't have the exact bill in front of me to, to remember what the title is, but what it is is a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions that school districts produce. So by 2025, we will start out with our high schools, which is our first round, to go through and make them more energy efficient looking at lighting, looking at whether we're using gas, looking at all those items where we can reduce our carbon footprint. So we hire a company initially that will go out and do the, the initial investigation. We will come back to you uh, with a company that then will actually do the work once, we've, once we're done with this initial investigation. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Um, you're all right. Um, 14.9, approval to award and negotiate contract with McDonald Miller Facility Solutions for the Central Administration Building Boiler Upgrade Project. The Executive Director for the Chief Operation Officer recommends that the Board of Directors approve the Superintendent negotiate and award a contract to McDonald Miller Facility Solutions for construction services for the CAD Boiler Upgrade Project <laughs> funding, funding source capital bond issue as approved by voters on February 11th, 2020. Move to adopt. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Thank you, Thank Morris. You. Morris, you had quite the evening tonight. It was. It's great to see you. <laughs> item 15, other business. There is none. And that moves us to item 16, board comments. And I would like to invite, um, I believe we have two of our student reps here. I will let you rock, paper, scissors it on who would like to go first. When you come up, just please introduce yourself and what school you're um, uh, representing, please. I'm Amelia, and I'm a um, first year school board representative, and I'm representing SOTA, School of the Arts. Um, in terms of I'm an ASB representative. I do public relations, so I manage all of the social media. Um, so in terms of ASB events, there hasn't been much, but we've been focusing on giving back to our community and focused less on like getting money as opposed to like giving back, because I feel like that's what a lot of places focus on. And in terms of giving back, we're also trying to give back to our seniors, since it's their last year, we want them to be able to fulfill like their time before they graduate by like donating for their senior breakfast, being able to help support their events and other events. We're mainly just planning. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. So those are, can I ask a question? Are those things that the ASB is doing um, mm -hmm. for seniors? 
Um, not all of them. We're trying to decide some like events that we can use to okay. give back to the other student body, uh, um, and then some specifically for seniors. Okay, excellent. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. And Amelia. Hi, I'm Lillian Taylor. I'm representing uh, Silas High School. Um, I don't really have much to say either. Um, our choir, uh, jazz choir and show choir, we are prepping to go to Disneyland next week and we're gonna hope and represent our school and our district and win some gold maybe. So we're excited for that. And that's all I have, so. Do you, can you talk a little about, do you know how many other schools from around the country are gonna be, how big of a competition this is? Um, it's like a decent amount. I don't remember the exact, like there are a couple, like I remember there was a school from Canada, maybe two, um, but there's one huge school that like brought everything and it was like, it was really, it was really cool. There was, a, there was a lot of different schools, a lot of different places, but it was really cool. So this has already happened or it's happening in two weeks? It's going to happen. Okay. And, and next week. Yeah. Okay. And it sounds like you've already been. We to went this? last year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you. Um, all right, I would open it up to uh, board members. Ooh, Chelsea, Chelsea, I'm sorry. Uh, no, go I, for it, Corey. I'm going to ask to go first. Because I, I support you, Vice President Schroeder. I did not have a board report this evening, and forgive me, team, I'm about to go rogue with what I say here. As, as we have stated prior to public comment, we, are, we welcome uh, the conversation. So to our staff that have come to speak on behalf of staff from, from Bernie, we appreciate your civic engagement for sure. All right, I'm going to start there. President Keating mentions after every person uh, says their piece, she says thank you. I'd like to take one of those thank yous back. And I think you guys all know who I'm talking about in the comment that was made here. I, I don't thank them for that. I don't stand by that. I'm not going to speak on behalf of the board. Everybody got their own voice, but I'm gonna stand on my own 10 here in front of everyone because he made those comments in front of everyone. I don't rock with that. So for the ones who come in and speak and like to have the difficult conversation, thank you. But for people who wanna come up here with foolishness, I do not appreciate that and I do not thank them for that. So I'm gonna stand here and I'll share that with you all. That's all I got for the evening, thank you. Thank you, Vice President. Um, General Counsel Benro. Yes. This is one of those board comments where I ask you mm -hmm. questions and then you answer them. Sure. And it helps illuminate things for me. Sure. And hopefully it can illuminate things for other people. Sure. Because if I'm lost, I know a lot of people are lost. All right. What's a consensus board? Uh, as it's used typically, a consensus board refers to a publicly elected board of directors that attempts to operate in a way where they come to a consensus on an issue they would vote on. Um, so there might be uh, a board that wasn't a consensus board might individually cast a vote without any um, time to sort of have a study session to discuss it, to try to figure out where different people are. A consensus board might try to come to a consensus on the issue that they're going to vote on. So are, are we a consensus board? A lot of boards do strive to be a consensus board um, in that they have a similar vision for where they want a school district to go. So in a study session, for example, they might talk about how could we reduce environmental impacts, for example, and then come to a consensus on like what a board goal for that could be. And another kind of board, each board member might have an individual goal they might have for like environmental impact, and they wouldn't reach a consensus wise. It would be this is yours, this is yours, this is mine. Mm -hmm. So I would, I mean, it's, you all could tell me if you think you're a consensus board, but I, I think most you. boards do strive to be that, yeah. Well, we strive to be one. Um, do y'all feel like we're consensus board or that's like the vibe? Okay, cool, because I had to double check some things because mm -hmm. I triple check everything that I say. Um, my other question would be then, mm -hmm. and, and me, myself, as an individual person, can I speak on behalf of the board? Uh, not as an individual person with the voice of the board on like a action item for official board business. That would need a vote of the quorum of the board, so at least three people would mm -hmm. have to, because a total of five people on the board, a consensus means a majority of that board. So three out of five would have to cast their vote to do that official board action. So typically, no, you couldn't just mm -hmm. say, I'd like to speak on behalf of everybody. So I cannot just on my own, an email, if I'm at the grocery outlet and someone's talking to me, I can't say, well, this is what the board is going to do. Uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of them and saying, this is for sure the actions that. of the board. I would agree with that. Okay, cool. Um, other question, 
Then I know that our role here is to oversee the policies. Um, I also always am reading, always learning. I know that it's, is it true, it's my role to evaluate the superintendent? That is correct. Do I evaluate any other staff? No, uh, every, the duties of a school board in Washington State aren't set district by district. Um, if somebody were to go into the state law book, you wanna look at 20, RCW 28A, that's called the Common School Code. That's, this is where the rules for all school districts live. Like if somebody said, what are the state laws that govern school districts? It's in RCW 28A Common School Code. So that lays out what the responsibilities of a school board are and who you evaluate, and that would be the superintendent and not staff that are not the superintendent. I mean, that really answers a lot of my questions. I think okay. I've been gone for a while, you know, and I gotta get some refreshers sometimes. I think that when I, t I stepped away from a personal matter, family emergency, um, I don't really ever try to talk about myself, really. We come to this board and like, we just try to do the work to like move community forward and like be transparent and be really honest, like in full transparency. My biological father passed away and I still showed up because I felt like the work, right, is really important and the students, right, they're really important. And I feel that oftentimes like students don't have advocates who will keep showing up. Like when my, when my life gets messy, I'm gonna step away. I'm gonna fall out. I don't have to be here, right? I think that we see that a lot with like celebrity and people like that. And sometimes when I'm approached to be this individual voice of the board, I get really concerned because I know that's not my job. And I know it's illegal. And I, and I want to be transparent and I want to be myself and I still want to step up and serve my community while being beholden to laws and a consensus board. So I always want to be clear with y'all, I will never speak on behalf of the board absent of your consensus. And also, as I'm not the board president, I cannot use my individual voice to speak on behalf of this board. And I just really wanna make that clear. Cause at the end of the day, like my job is to show up, do my job, govern the policies and evaluate that one person. Correct? I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah. All right, that's my board report, thank you. Thank you. And can I add for a point of clarification, because I know we, um, we have a board inbox, a board email box, where all the, and, and please use it. I mean, it's board at tacoma.k12.wa.us. We want to hear, uh, just like we'd like, you know, hear for people come and talk today. But we, because we are a consensus board, and I will declare that, because <laughs> we work really hard, we really hard to, to be a consensus board. In, and it's the um, WASDA, which is the Washington State School Directors Association, uh, puts out um, criteria and and you know kind of um, policies that we should be living by. And one of them is is that we speak with one voice, and the president, whoever the president, whoever is sitting in that chair, speaks on on our behalf on things that we've taken a position on, or you know in terms of that school board box. So if you've written to us individually as board members. We're gonna send it to the board box and you're gonna get a response, not from me, even if you send it to me, you're gonna get one from the board president because you're not the only one who's got this question and we want the answers to be consistent. And so just, I know that, that people may be confused. And if it's a very, if it's an individual thing, which you know, we've had, you and I have had a conversation and you send me an email, yes, I'm gonna to respond to that. But if you're you know, kind of making a comment or asking a question that has broader spectrum or scope, then, then the, the board president works with the vice president and then works with the other three of us that are not in leadership at the time and you know about certain issues but the email will come from the board president on behalf of the board so just don't want people to feel like if you wrote each of us individually but only one person wrote back feeling somehow the rest of us don't care or the rest of us um, were just dis being disrespectful that's not the case we're following the protocol that WASDA puts forth about high quality board operations so I think it's just really important we all know that it's 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 a very big job to be the school board president um, and vice president. It, there's a lot that goes on, so we appreciate that, which is, you know, when we, we rotate the role and, and we all, um, you know, get a chance at it, and it's, it's a lot of hard work. So I want you all to know that we all care, we all listen to you, and, um, and thank you for, for your input. Yeah. Did you have any other? You know, I you don't. We had Easter break, and uh, since the last board meeting, and and I actually relaxed, so I have nothing wow. to share. Woohoo! Okay. It was fun. I did. Not sure how, but I. 
Um, I would like, I know there's, there were other events before spring break, but my, um, this week has <clears throat> been a lot. So, oh, did you have more to say? Oh, I, I was get listen, listen, you, sir, sir. Um, on Friday before spring break, um, I went to the Lincoln Multicultural Assembly, which was spectacular. Um, I was uh, having, um, being a very proud Gen X uh, survivor, um, I was so impressed with I like thought back a lot through that whole assembly watching the students and the way that they supported each other, um, regardless if there was a you know, mistake in a performance or something didn't, a prop didn't work or if there was like music that got messed up, like the level of like genuine care um, that the students gave each other, um, it was just, um, I don't really remember growing up like that. And, you know, like, I don't remember us Gen Xers uh, behaving quite as gracious, caring, and supportive, but <clears throat> that could have just been where I was at. Um, and I know it's not the only school that is like that, um, but I just was so impressed. There were, I think, I lost count, but I, I think around 15 performances. Um, and I, I think 12. If I, if I did that math right, which please don't trust that, um, there are about 12 different um, ethnicities and um, heritages that were represented. Um, the um, uh, Native Club started it off and Puyallup tribe members came and did a land acknowledgement and um, a performance, um, a traditional Native um, performance. It was just, the whole thing was really amazing and um, it did run over a while but um it was just a really special um event and i'm sad that amanda um peterson our um, one of our board reps who is at lincoln was not here but i did get to see amanda there and she was very um just really grateful that um, i came and so to the whole student body that put that on and staff that supported them um, it's amazing and i am a big fan of mount t's multicultural assembly as well and so i can't wait for that one to happen um so I, I'm sure there are other things that happened that week I just can't recall. Um, and uh, I think with that, um, I'm going to, unless anybody else has anything else to add, Superintendent? Yeah. Nobody? Okay. Um, with that, I will move on to item 17, mm -hmm. announcements of next regular board meetings. April 18th, 2024, there will be a study session um, at 6 p.m., April 25th, 2024, there will be a business meeting at 6 p.m. And on May 9th, 2024, there will be a business meeting also at 6 p.m. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>